Hi class, today we are going to talk about first cut sequence diagrams and this is all you need for your lab 6. We are going to start by looking at some examples first. Look at this. Here, register is the name of an object. That object is an instance of this class. And then the same is true for the other objects in this part of a sequence diagram. This, this vertical dashed lines, we call them object lifeline. They show uh, that your objects are in the memory. The vertical bars, they show activation time. So they're called activation bar and they show that that object is doing something in the software for you at that time. So here my register um, is asking an account uh, to get the balance that's due. That number is returned from account receivable object. And then this condition, if it's true, we call this a guard, then the register object will ask the class object the name is drama to add this student to itself so here um, is what happens your objects they go from left to right and the time sequence from the top to the bottom Look at the same example with a little bit more detail. So we have the same three objects. They do things for us. Account receivable knows the balance that's due. And the class is the one that's able to add a student to itself. The only difference is that we have a big box here. We call it an optional box. So that condition that was there, we had it before we um, uh, called a method or invoked a method in another object here if you wanted to do a series of actions that they all depend on a specific condition you put them in a box or a frame called opt frame or optional frame this is another example of a sequence diagram you have a bank object a check object and a checking account object the check knows the amount that's written on it checking account knows the balance that's there and this frame we call it alternative frame it helps you implement if then else condition so if the balance is greater than or equal the amount do these things else do the other things so this is alternative frame the this one this sequence diagram has an alternative frame it has an optional frame and it has a loop so we have an order object, we have two distributor objects, and we have a messenger. One of the distributors is careful, one is regular, and depending on the value of the item, one or the other works for you. So this is the condition for the alternative frame. The loop goes on for each item, and the optional frame takes care of the confirmation in case the sender has asked for it. Um, this is a hungry person, this is a microwave oven object. I want you to read this and try to interpret it. Okay, if you thought about this, what does this frame do here for us? This is what we call a parallel frame. If you need to do things at the same time or in parallel, you would use this frame this is the summary alternative frame loop frame optional frame and parallel frame i want to stay here and tell you something if you wanted to go from a system sequence diagram which is something like this it shows the steps but it views the system as a black box to a sequence diagram that has objects in a system as a black box has objects inside this system. 
If you wanted to convert a system sequence diagram to a sequence diagram, you need to have your domain model class diagram. Now, some of you have done this exercise, some of you haven't. In a sequence, in a system sequence diagram, you show the steps very similar to what you did in your activity diagram. The only difference is the naming. So here you name the activities as if they're methods inside some of your objects. And then you think about data parameters in and out. So still the steps, the difference is the naming and the data parameters. And you view the system as a black box. Now here is adding a seller in a system that has a domain model class diagram like this. I want you to pause for a minute and tell me if you wanted to look into that black box that's called system and replace it with one, two, three, or as many objects here as you need, which one of them will show up in your sequence diagram? And that's the question you're going to ask yourself. Look at your activity diagram. Look at the system swim lane and the activities that are performed there. Now, this is system as a black box. What objects from which classes are going to do these steps for me? And that's the process you're going to take to create your first cut sequence diagram. Look at your activity diagram or system sequence diagram. A few of you have that, but you don't have to have that. Just look at your activity diagram. Look at the system or subsystem swim lane. Look at the activities and tell me what objects inside the system will do those for you. That's it. You have your first cut sequence diagram. So here is adding a seller and you see that there is a person in the system, could be a seller, could be a buyer. So you think that you would need a person, you would need a seller account and Maybe that's it. Okay, so here adding a seller, and this is this first code sequence diagram. You need to create a person and you need to create a seller account. This controller, this is something that I call, um, we call a pattern. And I'm gonna talk about that in details in one of my videos. But just to give you an idea, this controller, um, the role it plays, it sits in between your user interface and your domain objects. It kind of gives you protection, it hides details of your business logic, and it adds a layer of security. We're going to talk more about that. What's important for you at this time is to be able to look at your activity diagram, look at your domain model class diagram, and replace that system with objects and this is a good step so a person is created here these are the steps and the person then creates a seller account now a question you may ask why not let the controller talk directly to seller account so instead of this link going here and then going here why not go directly from controller to that Again, we're going to go back to the idea of coupling. In object-oriented design, we don't want many objects to talk to many other objects. That's not a good thing. Here, the controller, it's enough that it talks to the person, and the person can then go talk to the seller account object or a buyer account object, depending on the situation. You don't have to let all objects interact with all other objects. Do it minimally. There is no rule. So we just go by our intuition. And this is a good example here that the person goes and talks to the seller account. I have a few more examples. What I want from you is to look at the system sequence diagram that I have and think about the system, whatever you know. This is the case study from the book. And you may just look at the methods and guess, okay, what do I need here? to replace the system object with. Probably I need a customer object, I need an address object, I need a payment object. Think about those and then look at the next slide and see if your ideas is close enough to the first cut sequence diagram that you see on the picture. So this is customer and address and account. 
they don't have a payment here but it would be a really good one this is a book example and remember book examples they're not supposed to be perfect so we can make them better controller is here and this is the same idea I discussed and I'm gonna talk more about that later you have a few more examples like this what I expect from you is to tell yourself what objects and then look at the solution is it close enough and then make sure you understand the steps okay so I create I asked the controller to create a customer the controller knows the customer can create one of itself and it goes from there to create addresses and account a few more examples like this just take a look at them and I would really suggest that you take a paper and pencil in front of you and just draw things you will have drawing examples on your exam so if you like just start preparing for the exam while you're learning the topic I'll be back with sequence diagrams in Argo UML talk to you soon